Amen. Friends, let's give it up one more time for Maddie Anderson, one of our amazing youth. People always say that our kids and our youth are the leaders of the church of tomorrow, of the future, and um, I couldn't disagree more. I think our youth are leaders today, um, and I'm so inspired by our young people. So, Maddie, thank you so much for always reminding us what it means to follow Christ. Friends, as you walked in today, you should have received your GPS, your guide for prayer and study. This is a tool we use each week to stay engaged with the word and prayer in worship and throughout the week. So on the front, you're going to find information about today's message and a place to take notes. Um, We encourage everyone to take notes about what is God saying to me today. We believe that God speaks to us when we open the word of God. So we encourage you to write that down. On the back, you're going to find scriptures and prayers to stay engaged throughout the week. We encourage you to be reading your Bible along with us as we go throughout our week. We are continuing in our Lenten series, The Christian DNA, um, and we are drawing all of this from our theme verse, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and as is our custom, we've been reading this out loud together. So will you join me as you see on the screen, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. That's what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. If we're a new creation in Christ, if we are Christians, followers of Jesus, what does that mean? What do we do when the church gets it wrong? How do we reconcile that? Because Christian is such an ambiguous word that sometimes even has negative connotations. So what does it mean to be a Christian? How do we deal with that? And what does that mean for our lives? So three weeks ago, we started by talking about we get our DNA from those who have come before us, that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrew talks about, those who have come before us thousands of years ago and those who formed and shaped us personally. They tell us, they teach us, they impart that Christian DNA to us. We don't have to make this up. We get it from all those who have come before Two weeks ago, Jordan Kramer reminded us that we are to define our personal Christian DNA, what it means for us personally to be a follower of Christ, by what God says, not by what society says. Everything in our world is telling us what to be and how to be and how to dress and what you need to be successful and what defines success and beauty. And Jordan reminded us that it's Christ that defines our life, that God truly makes us into that new creation. And last week we talked about God's love making us a family, that when Christ started the church, when he gathered the 12 disciples around him, he wanted to form a family, a group of close-knit people that would love one another and be a community. The church is a family, not just an organization, and God's love makes that possible. But we have to be willing to get involved. If we treat the church just like any other organization or extracurricular activity, that's only ever as deep as our faith is going to be. But if we're willing to do what it takes to make the church a family, to get involved, to let people in, to just be honest with the people in this room, the church can become that family. And we said if you want the church to make a difference in your life, you have to let the church make your life different. But when you do, it's amazing what happens. Today, we're going to talk about what we do when our life becomes different. How does our Christian DNA affect the world? How does it affect the way we interact the way we think, the way we see, the way we treat people, the way we vote, the way we talk on Facebook, the jobs we have. How does being a Christian affect the way we live in the world? How do we engage with that in society? Not just with ourselves at home, not just within the walls of the church, but what do we do when we leave this building? And how does our faith make our life better and more fulfilled and not make it more complicated? So that's what we're going to talk about here today, and in a second, Buddy's going to come read our scripture, which is the story of Bartimaeus. It is this wonderful story of this man Jesus encounters right before he enters into Jerusalem, and something really amazing happens. So Buddy's going to read that story for us. Today's scripture is Mark 10, 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called up the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, 
Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Thank you so much, buddy. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to you here this morning seeking to understand how our lives are to be led in our world. Sometimes it can feel like church and your word makes sense here or when we're at home studying scripture or speaking amongst friends who agree with us. But God, what do we do when we encounter people who disagree? What do we do when we log on to Facebook and we can't help but jump in? What do we do when we go to a family reunion, when we stop by for Thanksgiving dinner and someone brings up politics? God, how does our faith determine the way we live in the world and how can it bring us peace and comfort and hope and not divide us further? God, help us to understand these big and huge questions today. Help us to see with new eyes the story of Bartimaeus so we can better understand this calling that you place on each and every one of our lives. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. So our text today is about the story of a man named Bartimaeus, this blind beggar that Jesus and the disciples meet on the road to Jericho from Jerusalem. So I want us to kind of walk through this story They came to Jericho, and as he and his disciples in a large cloud were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting there on the roadside. Jericho is only a few miles from Jerusalem. It's very near to it, and the road from Jericho to Jerusalem was infamous. It was treacherous. It was very well known. And this is, they're heading towards Jerusalem here in the second half of Mark. And the entire second half of Mark is about this moment, getting to Jerusalem. In chapter 8, Peter makes a declaration that Jesus is the Messiah and everything from that point on. Mark is 16 chapters long, and in chapter 8, right in the middle, the whole book pivots, and everything is about Jerusalem. Everything Jesus says and does is about getting to Jerusalem, and so they are laser-focused on this and the significance of what's going to happen. And their eyes are so fixed on this purpose that when they encounter this blind beggar, which was not uncommon, on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, you see the disciples trying to get him out of the way. He calls out for Jesus, and they say, no, you get out of here. Get out of the way. We're on a mission. We have something to do, and they don't see him. Now, Bartimaeus is really interesting because there are some things that make him unique in our scripture. Bartimaeus is the only person who seeks to be healed by Christ whose name is given to us. When you see somebody who comes up to Jesus asking to be healed, it's always just a woman who had a condition or a man who was blind or a woman who was, you know, had had this illness or um, a, a woman brought her child who was suffering from a great disease. They're never named Bartimaeus is the only one that's given a name. Bartimaeus is the last person that Jesus will heal in Mark's gospel and the only person Jesus heals who follows him after being healed. So Bartimaeus is really important because we see there's so much more detail given about his life. He's given a name and he follows Christ after he is healed. And so we see the significance and it happens right before Jesus enters Jerusalem There's no reason when Mark is writing this gospel to point out Bartimaeus unless he has a big important thing to play because the whole point of the gospel is getting to Jerusalem. Why is there this story of this blind beggar on the side of the road? He must be significant. So in general, I've been trying to figure out how we talk about this topic for the last four weeks. What does it mean to be a Christian? And I feel like it's so hard to have those answers, especially in our world. And And so I I think sometimes it's more important to know the right questions to ask. I think sometimes we focus on having the answers too often, and I think sometimes knowing the right questions to ask can really help us get there. And so today I want to give you some questions to think about as we study this idea of what does it mean to be a Christian in our world? How does our faith affect the way we live? So the first question I want you to think about is, do we see the Bartimaeuses of today? the blind beggars on the side of the road as we're on the way to Jerusalem, do we see the people like this in our society or do we act like the disciples and push them to the side? So let's look through this text. When they heard, when he heard, when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many of the disciples sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, son of David, 
have mercy on me. The disciples didn't see Bartimaeus. They were focused on Jerusalem, and they told him to be quiet. They don't see Bartimaeus. But I think Bartimaeus is very important because he's given a name. So obviously the writer of Mark wants us to see Bartimaeus. And one of the things I think this reminds us is that we have to be careful not to reduce people to one thing. When the disciples see Bartimaeus, they don't see Bartimaeus. They just see a blind beggar. And that's all that person is to them. I know everything about you. You're a blind beggar. And we do that to people all the time based on race, based on gender, based on socioeconomic status, religion, language, political identity, right? We see someone driving and we see, you know, a year ago, if you saw a Trump sticker on someone's car or a Clinton sticker on someone's car, immediately you made assumptions about them, good or bad, depending on how you feel. And we reduce a person to that one thing. Oh, you're that. It's so easy to do this. And I think one of the quick lessons here is Jesus is trying to point out, and Mark is trying to point out, don't reduce someone to one thing. Bartimaeus has a name. He's not just a blind beggar. Emma recently told me a story she heard on NPR, told me about it, um, and she said there was a guy on NPR who was talking about this dictionary he made up. I was like, what do you mean he made up a dictionary? She's like, yeah, he made up this dictionary. So I started to do some research, and I found out, and here's a, a description of it. When we can't describe how we're feeling, we often say, I just can't put it into words, but this is what I'm feeling. And so um, a man named John Cohen decided he was going to solve this problem. In his made-up dictionary, he invented words to describe our most abstract and ephemeral emotions. John is the founder and author of an online dictionary of made-up words called the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. His dictionary aims to fill the gaps in the English language with terms to describe new emotions. I want to give you a few examples. One word he came up with is xenosign, which is the sense that time moves faster the older you get. And we say this all the time. It seems like time just flies by, and the older I get, the faster it goes. And we know this emotion, but there's no word for it. And so John said, I'm going to make up a word for it. So that's one he did. Another one is um, opia, the ambiguous intensity of looking someone in the eye which can feel simultaneously invasive and vulnerable. There's a weird feeling when you make eye contact with someone. It is very intimate. It can be very off-putting. A lot of times we want to look away. There's something about looking someone in the eye, but we don't have a word for it. So John says we should call it opia. Velicor is another one. The strange wistfulness of used bookstores, which are somehow infused with the passage of time. You walk into an old bookstore, and it just feels different. It smells different. There's something about it. It feels out of time. Velicor is that emotion he describes. One of the funnier ones I found is one called hanker sore. Finding a person so attractive, it actually kind of pisses you off. (laughs) And he says, you know, there are some people in life that are just too beautiful. It's not fair. You know, it doesn't make me happy. When, you know, when you're attracted to someone, usually you're like, oh, that's, they're so beautiful. But there are some people where you're just like, that's just rude, all right? It's not fair that you were born with that amount of DNA, right? It is just not fair. You're too beautiful. Your hair is too thick. You don't, your body is too perfect. It just makes you mad. <laughs> Hanker sore, that's what he says. The one I want you to think about today is called Sonder. Sonder is the realization that every random passerby is living a life just as vivid and complex as your own. It's the realization that every person you see in the periphery, every person you see is living a life just as complex and deep as you are. There's a quick video explaining this I want you to watch now. You are the main character, the protagonist, the star at the center of your own unfolding story. You're surrounded by your supporting cast, friends and family hanging in your immediate orbit. Scattered a little further out, a network of acquaintances who drift in and out of contact over the years. 
There in the background, faint and out of focus, are the extras. The random passers-by, each living a life as vivid and complex as your own. They carry on invisibly around you, bearing the accumulated weight of their own ambitions. Friends. Routines. Mistakes. Worries. Triumphs and inherited craziness. When your life moves on to the next scene, there's flickers in place. Wrapped in a cloud of backstory and inside jokes and characters strung together with countless other stories that you'll never be able to see. That you'll never know exists. In which you might appear only once. As an extra sipping coffee in the background. As a blur of traffic passing on the highway. As a lighted window at dusk. I often wonder how we see these extras, these background characters in our life. Do we see them as just people filling in the space around us? Or do we recognize that each and every person that we see has a deep and rich and complex life full of fears and aspirations And to them, you're just a background character. This realization, I think, is so interesting. Do we see the extras? Do we see the background characters in our life? Many disciples sternly ordered Bartimaeus to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still. Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He's calling you. Jesus sees Bartimaeus, stops everyone, and calls him forward. Every person we see in our daily lives has a deep and vivid life, just as complex as our own. And we have to be careful not to reduce those people to one identity, to one thing, to one external identifier that we can see and we think we understand. So it's important we look for the divinely crafted child of God present in all people, the ones we know so well and love, the ones we know so well and hate, and all the background characters. Do we see Bartimaeus? The second question I want you to consider today is, do we see what Bartimaeus sees? It's important to see the Bartimaeuses in our society, but do we see what Bartimaeus sees. A lot of times when we talk about this topic, what does our faith do in the world? How does our faith change the way we live? We usually see that here in the church through mission work. I'm going to go out into the world and do something good. I'm going to go help the poor. I'm going to feed the hungry. I'm going to go be the hands and feet of Christ. And we put ourselves in the role of Savior. And we want to go out and do something. But in reality, this character, Bartimaeus, this blind beggar on the side of the road, understands who Jesus is and what's happening so much faster and clearer than all the disciples. And I want to show you what I mean. Starting in in verse 47, when Bartimaeus heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy. Mercy on me. Son of David is a messianic term, meaning it's referring to Jesus being the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. And that was a really important claim. And to that point, there was only one person in the whole Gospel of Mark who has ever said that about Christ, and it's Peter. In the eighth chapter of Mark, Jesus is with his disciples as far out as they ever travel in a place called Caesarea Philippi, and he gathers them around and he says, We've been walking for a while. What do people say about me? What do people, who do they say that I am? And they list a bunch of things. You're one of the prophets. You're Elijah. They've got a lot of ideas about who you are. And Jesus asks a fundamentally transformative question. But who do you say I am? You who have walked with me, you my best friends, who do you say I am? 
And there's this awkward silence, and Peter, being pretty impetuous, jumps out first. And he says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. And he's the first person to ever identify that. Jesus himself had not even said that about himself yet. And Bartimaeus, here in this story, becomes the second person in Scripture to name that same title to Christ. This random blind beggar on the side of the road is the second person to see that Jesus is is the Son of God. Underlying in all the Gospels is this idea that people have missed who Jesus is. They've missed the point. They've misunderstood to the point that when John writes his Gospel, in the very beginning of his Gospel, he says, Jesus came to his own people, and his own people didn't recognize him. They put him to death. We missed who Jesus was. It's an underlying theme in all the Gospels. And here, on the side of the road from Jericho, is a blind man who truly sees who Jesus is. Jesus stood still and said, come, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came over to Jesus. He threw off his cloak. Earlier in this very chapter of Mark, Jesus encounters a very rich man. And he comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a great question. And Jesus says, follow the commandments a pretty good answer. And the rich man says, I have done that since I was a child. I've done that my whole life. And he says, there's one more thing you must do. He knew he was very rich. He says, sell everything you have, give all your money to the poor, and then follow me. And the rich man went away really sad because he had a lot of stuff and he wasn't willing to do it. And unfortunately, many people have taken this and read it to say, if you want to follow Christ, you have to be poor. You have to sell everything you have. You have to give everything away. And people say, I'm not going to do that. It's a deal breaker. I'm not going to put my family out on the street. Why would I do that? But this story isn't about money. Jesus is trying to point out, what are you putting first? Are you willing to give up everything and follow me? It doesn't mean I'm going to make you do that, but are you willing to? What are your priorities in life? For this man, like many of us, it was his money, his status, his safety, his control over things. At the end of the day, for most of us, money equals control. We can control where we live, where our kids go to school, what happens to us, the type of medical care we receive. We can control things. And he wasn't willing to give that up. And Jesus is trying to make this point. It's not about money. It's about having God first in your life. Bartimaeus was a poor blind beggar. His coat was probably the only possession he had. And in a crowd like that, throwing it off, he never would have gotten it back. His only possession Bartimaeus is willing to do what this rich young man we just met a few verses earlier was unwilling to do, throw off everything he has to follow Jesus. Then Jesus said to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. What do you want me to do for you? This question he asked Bartimaeus. The story immediately preceding this Bartimaeus story is when James and John come up to Jesus, two of his disciples, and Jesus asks them the same question. What do you want me to do for you? And they say, we want to be your right-hand dudes. When you come into your kingdom, like we want to be your right-hand guys. We want to be right there. They wanted power. They wanted status. They wanted to be right hand of God. They wanted for themselves. And Jesus denies their request and says, you don't understand what you're asking, and that's not what I'm here to do. But he says yes to Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus is asking the right question. Bartimaeus isn't coming looking for selfish power, isn't looking to get all his status, isn't looking to be awesome. Bartimaeus wants to see. He knows the right question to ask. And so Christ heals him. Jesus says to Bartimaeus, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Jesus heals Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus becomes the only person to follow Christ after being healed. We often ask ourselves if we see the Bartimaeuses in our society. Do we see these poor, blind people? Do we recognize that they have humanity? And that is a beautiful and amazing place to start, and we should be asking ourselves that question. But the next step is not just to see those people, but to recognize that sometimes the blind see more than we ever will. And here in this story, we see Bartimaeus doing what none of the disciples can do. He sees that Jesus is the Messiah. None of the disciples got that except for Peter. 
He's willing to give, get rid of everything he owns, which this rich young man who was very faithful was unwilling to do. He comes humbly just wanting to see. He's not seeking power and authority and riches like two of his own disciples were. And he follows Jesus. Here on the side of the road from Jericho, this blind beggar sees more than all of the disciples combined. Do we see the Bartimaeuses in our society? We should. But do we stop to think that maybe they understand God even better than we do? Do we see what Bartimaeus sees? The last question I want you to consider is this. What do we do about all this? I know a lot of you in this place feel this calling to try to make the world better. You want to speak truth to power. You want to get out there on a big issue and you want to try to make change. You want to make our world a better place. And we're all called to do this. We're called to speak truth to power. But I will tell you, there is no power on Facebook. If you want to speak truth to power, there's no power on Facebook like that, right? It's more like speaking truth to stupid. Let's be honest. You get more than three comments deep on a Facebook post, reason goes out the window, right? Like caps lock has been engaged at that point. It's just all emojis and gifts at that point. I mean, it is just ridiculous. So a lot of us, get, we take to Facebook because we want to take on the righteous cause. And how many of us have ever done this? I never make posts about, pol- about politics, but I just couldn't keep quiet today. Now, sometimes those can be very prophetic words. But a lot of times, we're shouting into the wind. We're joining a chorus where everybody we follow thinks the same way we do. And so we're not really changing anything. We're trying to speak power. We're trying to speak truth to stupid. And that's not the way it works. You have to speak love to stupid. You have to speak peace. So I want to give you a challenge if you're a Facebooker. This week, try to write a Facebook post every day that breathes life and love and peace into the world. Don't gossip, don't complain, and no ranting for one week. Just see if you can do it. For those of you who are avid Facebookers, this may be a good challenge for you. Spreading love is what Christ calls us to do. That's what God said, that's what God calls us to. Another question I want you to consider is that if we are called to speak truth to power, We have to be willing to admit that sometimes we're the power that needs to hear the truth. We have to be willing to admit that we might be wrong, which none of us want to do. It's so easy to take to Facebook and say, this is what I believe, and ah, rah, 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 rah. It just drives me crazy and grinds my gears when people do this. Okay, what are you doing that somebody else is complaining about you? There's a parable in there, something about a speck and a log. We have to admit sometimes that we might be wrong. We might be the power that needs truth spoken to. Throughout Lent, we've been using these journals as a spiritual discipline and trying to write out thoughts and reason way some of our beliefs through this. If you didn't get one or if you've lost yours um, during Lent, there's a whole bunch of them in the basket on the back. I encourage you to pick one up on the way out. Our prompt for today gives you a few questions to think about. You can write whatever you'd like. Our questions today are, how does your faith affect the way you live your life? How you vote, how you raise your children, how you treat strangers, the type of job you consider, all these questions. I encourage you to think about this. How does your faith make your life different? Or does it? Because for a lot of people, it's easy to be a Christian in the church. But as soon as we go into work, as soon as we walk into a voting booth, as soon as we walk into a family reunion, we're a different person. And our faith gets checked at the door. How does your faith change the way you are? Friends, Jesus sees us sees us like he saw Bartimaeus. Jesus heals us and makes us a new creation. And as a new creation, our faith, our identity, our DNA should affect everything we do in our life. Not just who we are on Sunday morning, but everything we do in life. I encourage you to remember that feeling of sonder, that made-up word that's so beautiful, that every person you encounter has a rich and vivid life. Every person. They are not defined by one thing any more than you are. And so try to see that each person is a beloved child of God. Whatever choices they've made, we have to start there, willing to recognize the humanity in people, the ones we love and the ones we hate. Remember that it is often the blind who see the clearest. Are you so focused on your busyness and all the things happening in your life 
that you miss the whole point of who Jesus is. And that's the disciples in this story. That's not the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Romans. That's the disciples. They totally miss the point of loving their neighbor. They tell this blind beggar to shut up because they have things to do. And they feel righteous and vindicated. Sometimes even the best miss the whole point because we get so busy. What's your coat? What are you unwilling to part with? For the rich young man, it was his money and his status. What is your coat? Christ asked that we shed everything to follow him. What's holding you back? What are you unwilling to let go of? Remember to speak truth to power, even if that power is yourself. And remember to speak love to stupid on Facebook, because no one ever wins an argument there. No one. No one wins an argument on Facebook. You know, I think I want to submit a new word to this new dictionary. Here's what I'm going to call it. Comment section psychosis. That's my new phrase. Comment section psychosis, which is defined by this. The self-delusion that you can actually change someone's mind on Facebook. Do we have anyone suffering from comment section psychosis in the room? Okay, Chris. All right, we have one honest person here. Yeah, all right. You can't change people's minds in that way. If you walk in loaded for an argument, they are too. No one's listening. He actually does have a word in his dictionary that uh, defines, I forget what the term is, but it's um, a conversation where everyone's talking but no one's listening. (laughs) How often do we do that? God makes us new. And I pray that we'll stop trying to be right, stop trying to be rich and famous, and start trying to be more like Bartimaeus to leave whatever's holding us back and follow Christ down the road to Jerusalem. Let's pray. God, we come before you often not sure what to do because we see the Bartimaeus is in our society and sometimes it makes us feel so guilty. Sometimes we feel like we can't do anything, so why even try? Sometimes we feel like it's our job to fix them, to save them, And so we try to play God. But God, what you call us to do is to see the humanity, to see the image of God in all people. You call us to see and recognize that people are not defined by one thing, that we are rich and elaborate, that we are defined by you. And God, we are called to see people that we deem as the Bartimaeuses, those who are worse off than us, to not look down on them because God we are only a day away from being a Bartimaeus some of us know what it's like to be in that position to feel like a blind beggar lost on the side of the road watching people pass us by telling us to shut up but God it is often the blind that see the clearest so we ask that you help us to see with your eyes to not reach for our keyboards when we see someone post something crazy on Facebook. And instead, to share love. You called us to love our neighbor, not to dissect their arguments. So God, help us to reach across the aisle, to reach across the computer screen, to reach across to our very neighbors whose name we may not even know, and to extend love. God, being a Christian, having this DNA means that every part of our life should be different. Not just how we are in church, but every part of our life. And you call us to be like you. To stop on the side of the road. To see the beauty of Bartimaeus. And to continue on this path. So God, may we be that way as well. Lord, we struggle. We get so busy, we get so selfish, then we feel guilty and we feel trapped in this cycle. So God, for all of us who feel lost and alone, for all of us who are so busy we can't breathe or see, for those who may even feel guilty here today that we are not doing anything for anyone else, help us to be forgiven, to let ourselves off the hook as we pray this beautiful prayer that you taught us. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.